Hebrews 9, 13, and 14. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to the to serve the living God. Heavenly Father, help Brother Dan to uh, speak good and um, help him in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for remembering us even in our in our absence last year. My my uh, assignment or my work this morning is going to be in the matter of associating sanctification with the blood of sprinkling. Specifically, the text speaks about the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer. So obviously the shadow is not what we're going to have in the limelight this morning. The shadow is regressing. So we're going to speak briefly about that, but it's a springboard to speak of that which we are actually entered into now, where Christ's blood is purging us. Specifically, the conscience, the conscience being uh, an unseen portion, but one that is absolutely necessary. Uh, several weeks ago, you brethren that are here at the Word of Truth, you had uh, Brother Aaron, I believe, brought a sermon from this very text concerning the conscience. So if you were there that night, and if you can recall back to that, that'll be very helpful to you as far as a groundwork considering the conscience and how the Scripture speaks about it. What I want to do is make some initial introductory comments, and then we'll go into the text itself. I'm going to read a little wider than what Tim read, and uh, this, this thought is actually all through Hebrews. I mean, this is not an isolated place where we find it, but you'll, you'll see as we go along. So the association of sanctification with the gospel of Christ in regard to the purging of the conscience was prefigured in the Old Covenant. And here, as Paul writes to the Hebrew believers, this ministration of the Spirit by the Apostle is actually a bold declaration. He's, he's not saying this might happen. He's saying this is happening, but it's a critical element accomplished in New Covenant believers. That's us. Not only, not only the Hebrews, but us. You have to have a purged conscience to effectively minister to God. It's critical to effective service. If you, if, we won't read the entire of chapter 9, but if you read it, the word service pops up again and again. And, and throughout the book, too. But that's what the priesthood was about. It was about service unto God. And so, of course, Jesus is providing the most crucial service unto God, but now we're being brought into that by the aid of our conscience being purged by his blood. The epistle to the Hebrews, as we know, stands as a very tower of reasoning, spiritually speaking. It presumes upon, it's written to the Hebrews, so it presumes upon a long-standing acquaintance they've had with the law. But what he's attempting to do is bring them from that into something higher and better. They are familiar with it, all the intricate workings, particularly in this area of worship or service unto God. A lot of them, though, really couldn't enter into it. The priesthood was the designated group, so by and large, the, a lot of the people were excluded. But he's opening up this new and living way. The stress and emphasis of the book is focused, though, upon the high priesthood of Christ himself. And then, of course, there are results from that. Some of you brethren have already begun to speak of these. The realities that result from that are apparent in all those that are believing. The Holy Spirit presents time and again in this book the better things, the better nature of the new covenant, better hope, better testament or covenant, better promises, better sacrifices, uh, a better substance, a better resurrection, all concluded under better things. The Hebrews, it, it does have stern passages of warning, but that's not the emphasis of the book. The book is not written primarily to, work of, to, to warn of lurking sinful practices. Some of the other books address you know, issues. Rather, it's to encourage a progression onward to there's a God-ordained shift that's taking place in the New Covenant. So he's, in, he's encouraging them upward in that. It's a higher, it's a nobler, it's a more effectual service, but it's engendered or brought about by the new birth. And not only is it birthed, started, but it continues on. See, it has to be sustained in Christ. And it is sustained by Christ. Let's, just as an example, I want to I read two passages that you all are familiar with, one from the Old Covenant writings and one from the New, and they sort of are like earmarks of where the people were. 
The first is from 1 Kings chapter 18. The question was asked to the people, how long will you halt between the two opinions? <laughs> and they didn't answer a word at that point, remember? Until they got a, a big vision of what the fire coming down and so forth. But this, sort of, this question sort of serves as a commentary on the compatibility of the law with the ill disposition of the adherents in and out and all about, see? But the new covenant encourages, it highlights who you are. It highlights, and when it does highlight the work of Christ, there's a resonance in believing people that they're able to just come up and enter into it. Amen. Beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation. See, that's where you live. That's, that's where the strength is. That's where we are. So we're presuming, as Paul writes, and we here this morning, we're presuming that the readers and the hearers, all of us, have been already inclined Godward. Okay, so we're on the same page with that. God, God's on the same page with you and you with him. So your heart has been changed and you're inclined toward him. So anything that he's designing to do in you, we're willing to receive that. So how does the gospel relate to a good or a pure conscience? There, there are several words, a good conscience, a pure conscience, a purged conscience, uh, without offense. You know, they're all sort of in the same category, but they're in opposition to the one that's defiled or the one that, the one that is not able to uh, be, be lightened up, as it were, to do the work it's designed to do in Christ. The old covenant didn't do anything with the conscience. It actually clouded it, made it, made it worse in a way. But the new covenant not only can, but it does. So let's, let's look at uh, three general categories that illustrate this connectedness of the gospel with a good or a pure conscience. The first, I'm just going to read the, the three kind of titles, and I'm going to go on through the, the body of what we have here this morning. Um, and they're sort of all integrated together. But the first is the message of the gospel is the source point for the cleansing of anything that has to do with your sin or or works that are holding you back. See, the, the message of the gospel heard and understood, that's where, the, that's where the help comes from. That's the high point. Secondly, the purged conscience as an effectual work is in progress. That's been stated too. So your, your conscience today, if as the Lord and the Holy Spirit continue working, it's going to be different down the road. But it's something that has to be continually addressed and, and the house cleaning has to continue to take place by his grace. Thirdly, we want to think of the result in the believers. As I've said, the, the burden of the text is that we would be able to serve God effectively. In fact, that's in our very verse. Our conscience is purged from dead works to serve the living God. And I'm not going to tell you do this and do that. That's not the point of service. Your service starts from who you are, and then the sky's the limit, literally. So, Think, think about this as sort of an example or as a, a picture of how this works. If you had a, if your inward man, who you are inside, the part that we don't see, if it was a committee, if it had numerous persons, there are seats for each person, a seat for your soul, a seat for your mind, a seat for your heart, and I realize these overlap and they're, and they're brought together, a seat for your will, but there's also a seat for your conscience, see? All of these, though, must be impacted by the new covenant working. All of them must be changed. All of them must be reformed from a former state to a latter state. Okay? So that's why he's talking about the conscience here. All, at, as they're changed, they, they're not changed, and one's over here and one's over there. See, all of them have to be changed in the same direction. They all have to function together. They have to function in agreement with the truth. See, they have to be brought into an alignment with a standard that God is making known. And, and not only that, but they, they have to remain available to the continuing work of the Holy Spirit. So if there's a shift that needs to take place, they're ready. God himself commands, ordains, purposes. He speaks the word. Jesus is the one that purchased with his own blood. He's the one that maintains this work from the right hand of God. He's the one that has secured the, that the work would take place. And the Holy Spirit is the one that implements the work. He's the one that like facilitates that it take place in you day by day by day. First Peter writes, Peter writes it this way in his first epistle. He says, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. Now, in this, in this said committee that I've, that I've just sort of made up here, of the faculties of your inner being, 
if there's a non-unanimous decision, this is going to lead to defilement. See, this is why your conscience has to agree. You're, remember the scripture in the New Covenant talks about your, I'll put my laws into their minds and into their hearts. It doesn't, there it doesn't address the conscience, but the conscience is addressed. See, it must be brought into the working. They all must function together. Your, your will can't like override your conscience. You can't have a great desire to do something and your conscience say, ah, I'm not sure I shouldn't go there. See, it's going to be confusion. Or your conscience can't ignore your heart's affection. If you really have a desire to do something that's good, but your conscience just sort of holds you back, see, those, those have to be bought, brought into congruity at some point. But that's what the gospel does, among many other things. It's, it's working in that direction. To the degree that the realities of Christ in the gospel are lively to you, you will have liberty. If the Son has made you free, you'll be free. Indeed, you will. So we're talking about the connection between the inward man, the gospel working on the inward man, and how that enables you to have a lively service unto God. Many people think of service just as outward acts, and those are included, but usually, well, not usually, those are resultant of an inward change, of inward acts, inward, inward thoughts toward the Lord. So we're, we're not going to hear a list, you know, these are the things when you're free that you're able to serve God and do thus and thus and well you didn't go far enough in fact in fact that's part of what your conscience has to be cleansed from we're going to talk about that too the message of the gospel when it's heard and understood and believed not not just at the beginning not only initially but also in a continuing life supporting fashion that's your life support system you hear the gospel in it and it works for you but it enables this synchronization of growth of all facets of the believer the, your, your parts, inward and outward, and all, the, all who you are, they don't just agree and then later kind of go their diverse ways. So they have to be synchronized so that you're able to effectively serve God. But that's what the gospel does. It, it, sometimes it seems like one's getting ahead of the other and one's behind the other, and some has to be brought up to speed, but they're all working for this effect that they would be brought into an agreement and a harmony with the truth. Amen. The conscience, though, now here we have... It's like, it's like the one that sits in the, in the back and always has something bad to say. In the, you know, in, in the, it's, it's sometimes it tends to be the reluctant or even stubborn member. However, persuading the conscience in regard to the truth revealed by the gospel of Christ is necessary. Now, he wrote this to the Hebrews. They, they actually were notable among those that were bringing in things from the past, and he's giving them the realities of the new covenant so that they could actually overcome and have their consciences purged from these things. Good things and yet things that had to be pushed to the outer outside. Let me just give you an example of that. Like remember Peter and uh, on the rooftop and with the sheet that came down? See he, he, he knew there were things he wanted to do and he wanted to serve the Lord but at first his conscience was very reluctant to go further than what it had been groomed to do for years and years. However, in that he saith, the Spirit, in that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. So when the, when the new comes, the old must go. This is the much more dynamic of the scriptures. Paul is a great user of this. If, he, he talks about like an if-then shift. shift. If, if this, then that. See, So we're reasoning from smaller to greater. The word itself, conscience, Con, science, talk, it's, it's like with knowledge, but there's several aspects of this. Let's distinguish just to say we did. Conscience itself is like people a lot of times just think of it as, is it right or is it wrong? Is it black or is it white? You know, it doesn't go any farther than that. Conscience is more than that, although it, it is that. It's also there's like a consciousness of being aware of what's going on around, how things are fitting together. How does this impact me or how am I impacting others around me. So now you have like an objective, right or wrong, or you have a subjective, is this best now? See, all those are fit together in your conscience. On, uh, on airplanes, they have a thing called, I, they used to call it a gyroscope. I think I've talked to you about this before. But it can tell you if you're flying sideways or upside down or where you're at. See, the conscience is like that. It's designed to orient you with the truth and orient you with what God has. So a, a clean and a purged conscience will do just that. 
but if it's if it's clouded and if it's not purged, then you'll have difficulty in uh, flying, as it were, in a spiritual sense. The psalmist wrote, and I, I love this, he says, In the multitude of my thoughts within me, thy comforts delight my soul. See, that, that's the, the inward man must be at peace, and then everything fl outward flows from that. But anyway, both, both the conscience as a right and wrong issue and a consciousness uh, as an awareness of your surroundings, both of these are addressed in the necessity of the matter of being purged. All must be purged. How did, how did the conscience get to this state? How, how did it get defiled? How did it need purging? Well, we can sum it up. We can say Adam. I think we got it from there. It needs to be cleansed. It needs to be washed to be suitable for service. And this was pictured to a great degree, remember, in the priesthood. Holy garments, holy food, all these different things. Remember when they, they, uh, they had the blood and they would put it upon, like, the right thumb and the right big toe and the right ear? See, there was a very complex picture, as it were, of every part of them being cleansed. But a pure conscience is one that's purged. The defilement has to be removed. A pure conscience is emptied, as it were, of excess baggage. The conscience has two aspects, and I want to talk about those for a few moments. The, not just two, but there are at least two main categories that can defile your conscience. Some of us, maybe it's more in the one category, some more in the others. I'm sure in all of us there are both present because the wicked one would use any device that he can, of course. In Romans 2, remember this verse. It talks about the ones, or it talks about the con their conscience bearing witness, their thoughts accusing or else excusing one another. So see, there's two, two ways that this can defile your conscience. The scripture here in verse 13, or rather in verse 14, it talks about purging your conscience from dead works. Uh, I think the phrase is only used one other place in Hebrews. It's in uh, chapter 6, but it's there it's categorically mentioned as something that you need to depart from. De dead works are something you need to get away from, get them out. So we see this sort of works must go. So if they're in the conscience, they must go. So anyway, these two categories. Firstly, they consist of the sinful deeds of your flesh, what you had and what you did and what you said in Adam committed in opposition to the laws and holiness of God. We all know what those things are. The conscience will bring this past up and try to defile you. It will defile you. It'll, it'll like stalemate your service. Well, see, I can't, I just really can't be used for God because of these sort of things, and they're hounding me. That's got to be purged out. We, we got to reckon upon the blood of Christ purging those sins. Secondly, there's this matter of works, especially outwardly good or religious works, can clutter the field too. Outside the realm of faith. See, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So the conscience will seek to pacify you that the works you're doing, even though they're unfruitful in God's sight, you're okay. See, but that's got to be purged out too. Both categories are dead from the standpoint of profitability. Neither one will profit you in your service to God. Remember the ones that in that day they'll say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do such and such? And he'll say, I, I didn't know you. See, they, they weren't purged from dead works. Some men have to be redeemed from the vain conversation, their manner of life, that was received by tradition from their fathers. These are actually the sort of works that even the Apostle Paul himself had to jettison. Let me read two texts just as a, a commentary on like a coming in and a coming out of these, of these works. This, these are both from Galatians in the first chapter, beginning in verse 11. Paul says, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me or by me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. So see how the two were mixed together. There were things he did, even though he didn't recognize them as against God, they were. He, he was doing them intentionally that he thought he was profiting God, but they were dead works. He had to put them out. I profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, 
being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. And then the, and then the transition, but when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the heathen. That's when he got going. That's when he could serve God. He says immediately, and it continues on. And then later on in the book, chapter 5 and beginning at the top, verse 1, after he has worked with the Galatians in areas that were necessary for, for them and for us, he gives this exhortation to them. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. These things that have been purged out and taken away, don't let them come back. Be on guard. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. See, he was the main advocate of this in time past, and yet now he's saying these things need to be swept out. I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. See, the two are not compatible. So any work that's not underwritten by faith is dead and must be purged from the conscience. Now, purging, the word itself, it, we're not saying forgotten, put out. We're rather saying removed in this way, removed as a condemning voice. Say, you can be, you can be condemned by a, sin, or a, a voice that's speaking to you in regard to your past sins, but there's also a falsely confirming voice. It can confirm you where you are when you're actually, you're just treading water. See, you're not really going forward. You're not really serving God. You're con whatever religious lie has come to you to hold you in a place, you're being held there. It's like the one in Pilgrim's Progress that fell asleep on the bench. See, nothing's happening. So we, purging is not just forgetting. Purging is rather removing, washing out, taking away. The next chapter over Hebrews 10, relates us or confirms to us the inability of the law or obedience to it to effect a real purge. Let me read a bit out of this. Chapter 10 and verse 1. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. A lot of times the apostle speaks in this manner, they and us, those and, and what we have now. So you see there's a shift. It's imperative that we notice this. So he says, for then would they not have ceased to be offered? There, there'd come a time when enough was done, right? No. No. Because that the worshipers once purged, if they were really purged, they would have had no more conscience of sins. But, but what it does was it actually fed fuel into the fire. They, they knew they had to come again. They would do something outwardly obvious. I've got to go and deal with that. They would come and deal with that. But they knew that if they did it again, they had to come back. They had to keep coming back and, and deal with it in the same way. So in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. And he's speaking primarily of the once a year day of atonement, but he's also speaking of all the other times when your neighbor, well, we knew something happened in his life, and look, he's got a sheep, and he's going down, you know, to the tabernacle there. But in those sacrifices, there's a remembrance made of sins every year because it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. That wasn't its design. It was a design that through years and years and years, men would be looking to a real sacrifice, a real cleansing and purging. And then I won't continue on, uh, but now we see the introduction of the son into the world. When he comes, he says. So that's where we are in the matter of purging. So Hebrews, Hebrews 10 here shows the inability of the law, but it shows that it did have a work to do and it did it well. It was a work as a shadow, but in a sense, it muddied the conscience to an even greater degree. The conscience was more cluttered. 
the remembrance of these things is actually in your conscience. It's not so much in your heart, but your conscience is defiled. Let's consider the ministry of the shadow of the text, where he speaks about the, the blood of the bulls and the goats and the ashes of an heifer. Let's look at that in regard to the clarification that the apostles making for us here. I want to read the text in a little bit fuller uh, measure here. Let's begin in Hebrews 9 and start at verse 11 this time. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect or complete tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say not of this building, not of this nature, not, he's just been talking about the candle stick and the table and the showbread and all these sort of things. He's saying it's not like that, it's this way. Nor did he come by the things that took place in that building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. And we've talked to great degree over all the, how all the shadows were completed and perfected and shown in the reality in Christ himself. So by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. That's like, that's the beginning. Forgiveness actually precedes service. You, you must be forgiven unto service. Remember when Isaiah went into the temple in uh, chapter 6, it, you know, he, he, he saw the Lord high and lifted up and, and the place was shaking and all these things were taking place. He said, I, woe is me. I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. Not only that, but I'm in the middle of a people of unclean lips. I'm, I'm in a bad way. Mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. And then what happened was one of the seraphims took the, the live coal, and remember he touched it, to his, to his uh, mouth. He says, he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, look, look, this, this is important. This hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. So purging precedes service. The next word to him was, the voice of the Lord said, Whom shall I send? And he knew he was going to answer this way, Here am I, send me. So if you desire this in your service unto God, here am I, send me. Make your calling and election sure in this matter of purging and allow the Lord to continue to work in that. But let's, let's look at the shadow here for a moment. I'm going to read uh, the last two verses I didn't finish here. 13, if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, it really did, it, it did really have a work there, but that wasn't the work in view. The work in view in Christ is how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, that's what will purge your conscience from these dead works unto service to the living God. And for this cause, he, Christ, is the mediator of the new covenant, so that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions, oh good, those are included too. See, all, all these other brethren of the old covenant are brought in. Even though the blood of bulls and goats was not effectual then, they didn't lose out. See, Christ has atoned for those sins of the past covenant too. Those under the first covenant, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal life. Here he gives, in a general sense, two examples of ceremonial sanctifying elements. He speaks about the blood of bulls and goats. Now, now, bulls and goats were not just, these were not just one animals in the yard. These were chosen. Even, even in the old covenant, it was very careful, very particular. You, you had to do it God's way. He, he had an order and a design in this. They were chosen. They were set apart. They were observed. It was ones that were undefiled. They were clean animals, too, as opposed to unclean. <clears throat> So what that means is they were suitable for sacrifice and sanctification. So in this work of cleansing the conscience, there's not only the sacrificial element of Christ paying for our sins on the cross, but there's also the continuing work of the Spirit to wash you and to continue to make you and keep you clean. Also, uh, for time's sake, we won't read in it, but go to Numbers 19. The entire chapter has an ordinance called the Ordinance of the Red Heifer, Okay, and, and you all are familiar with that. This is where after the, after the heifer was killed, it was reduced to ashes, and then the ashes were set aside outside the camp, and when anyone had some sort of a sin of defilement, they would 
be able to access that cleansing. They would, it would be mixed with water, uh, it would be sprinkled on them, and then after a certain amount of time, they would be able to come back into the camp. And even in that text, there's a wonderful illustration. It talks about on the third day, they'll be made, I forget the language exactly, but on the third day, they'll be clean, and then on the seventh day, they'll be seen as clean. See, that's how we are. On the third day, we were made clean, and on the seventh day, everyone's going to know it. <laughs> Both of these shadows pertain to the process of sanctification. The blood signifies a life surrendered. The ashes signify the reduction of the sacrifice to ashes, but they're preserved in a memorial. So we, in our sanctification, we're constantly remembering how Christ has accomplished these things for us. That's what aids your conscience. It's, it's not that you're in a flux about, well, should I, shouldn't I? That's, see, that's real, a real low-level understanding. The conscience has to be one that is able to, to rise up and one that is able so that you're able to just freely go out and serve God in whatever manner he sets in front of you. In Exodus 24 and 29 and other texts, uh, I believe in Leviticus, but there are many examples of what's, what, they, what they did. It was called the sprinkling of the blood. The sprinkling of the blood, after the sacrifice was killed, part of the blood many times was poured out, remember, around the bottom of the altar. But there was also a portion reserved that would be sprinkled. It was sprinkled on the horns of the altar, on the altar itself. It was sprinkled by the high priest when he went in on the mercy seat. It was sprinkled on the book of the covenant. But also, this is key, it was sprinkled on the people, all the people that were there. See, this is the blood of sprinkling that we've come unto. The, the holy things are not so much distinguished from the holy people now. See, we are the holy, we are the holy ones. And so the, the blood of Christ continues to have this work among us. Amen. Our text in Hebrews is pertinent to not only the eternal redemption that has been obtained, remember it says having obtained eternal redemption, but also the continuing need for the sprinkling of the blood. We stand in need of the blood of Christ to cleanse from any residual defilement, any defilement that surfaces. See, the blood of Christ is, is available and, and is that which cleanses us. So we're not only cleansed from the guilt, but also from its defilement. But see, the conscience is always weighing these sort of things. How, am I cleansed? How am I? See, but the conscience must be in accord with, the, with God's truth in regard to these things. He said this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The outward is a ceremonial, as in the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer. So they did their work. An outward act would take place, or maybe on a mission of something they should have done. They had to go down and avail themselves of the blood of bulls and goats or the ashes of an heifer. After a certain amount of time, now you receive back. Everybody knew it. See, it's all, it's all external. It's all outward. They knew how many days. They knew how it had to take place, where they had to be, what time, all these things. But we're talking about a little different thing. The outward performance was only valid for external compliance to the law. They had, uh, they had it on record. They had the book, the, the Law of Moses, written down. If they followed through the ritual that was designed for them, they would be clean to re-enter the camp. They would be clean to do their priestly duties if they were of Levi, whatever it may be. However, see, there's more. An inner work at the level of the consciousness of sins is only accomplished by the blood of Christ. Their point, at their point in time, this was not God's design for how it should be you know, laid out, but now it definitely is. See, we don't, we don't regress into any form of, of ritual to cleanse, be cleansed from sins. We go unto Christ himself. This is by far the greater and enduring work. By the declaration of the new covenant, God put his laws into believing hearts and minds. So if the conscience is somewhat slow to respond, the sprinkling of the blood is efficacious there too. So how much more shall the blood of Christ purge the conscience from any form of dead work? Purge it unto the purpose of a fruitful and unrestricted service unto the living God. Well, that's, that's for us to work out in our salvation. Is that right? What shall we say to these things? 
Upon any sense of defilement, whether it be a sinful thought or deed, or any inclination within to rely on flesh to gain God's favor, or any hindrance that is going to be supposedly imposed upon you by men, whatever defilement seeks to enter or to stay, let us receive the sprinkled blood by means of remembrance of the one sacrifice for the sins of the world. That's where we go. And then we must, not only is this a, a reality in fact and as a body, but we must each avail ourselves of our advocate in heaven. There's an advocate in heaven for you. The one who is a propitiation for my sin. And each of you say, my sin. See, it's not, it is the sins of the world, but it's also our sins. Through songs, through hymns, through the ministration of the word, through prayer, through individual contemplation of the work of Christ, through partaking together of the body and the blood of Christ at our times of around the Lord's table. All of these, all of these are like the blood of sprinkling. It continues to speak better things. So then we can say, as the apostle did over in chapter 13, in verse 18, he said, pray for us. For we trust we have a good conscience in all things willing to live honestly. May the Lord continue to help you in this manner.